A common theme in Specivo is the reshuffling of various trophic and ecological roles. And when the new hand is cast, the most frequent winners are often rodents. With many larger mammals often being booted out in vague ways, or somehow still extant in even vaguer ones, rodents tend to inherit the earth. But just how likely is this? Do rodents actually have what it takes to become the top dogs, cats, antelope, and so on? And is everyone else really that fragile? To start, one thing that already makes rodents so successful is their ability to sleep anywhere, and so can you with a manta sleep mask. As well as for home napping, the small size yet good materials of a manta sleep mask mean you can take them anywhere and on any transport. Crush them in your luggage or pocket and they'll just bounce right back, so you can still get a good night's sleep wherever you go, and whatever visual stimuli you need to drown out around you. And as a user myself, I can assure you of their comfort and effectiveness. No matter what shape your head or your sleeping style, you're covered with Manta Sleep and their variety of masks, including their standard variety, cool, steam, silk, weighted, and Bluetooth sound, for those who like music or the Unnatural History channel as they drift off to sleep. So you can follow the link on screen now or in the description and use my code UHC for 10% off so you can finally get a good night's sleep. So to begin, perhaps the most frequent use of this trope is rodents becoming successful predators, and the grandfather of it being implemented is of course Dougal Dixon's After Man, with several species but perhaps the phalanx being the most prevalent of the predator rat group, which are essentially discount carnivorans. But do we need to go so far into a speculative future to find such animals? Do any rodents today possess especially carnivorous attributes? And yes. One, the rakali, is essentially the rodent attempt at an otter. It lives chiefly off other aquatic animals, mainly invertebrates but also fish and birds to varying extents too. It's chiefly found in Australia, where there are no native placental carnivorans or mustaloids to steal its thunder, and it took it upon itself to fill that niche. In this regard, the Rakali is already essentially a spec idea working as intended. The carnivoran niche of otter or mink was left open, and a rodent filled it to the letter. It even exceeds mink at swimming too, although other aquatic animals like otters and beavers have a lower cost of transport in the water than the Rakali. Annoyingly, the terrestrial cost of transport for those two was not provided to compare though. So whilst perhaps arguably not quite as specialised as an otter, the Rakali has done its job pretty well. This also isn't uncommon, with the Ichthyomini being a tribe of fish and crab-eating rats. These are rare South American rodents that typically prefer high-altitude streams, where they can eat small fish and invertebrates, but they will also help themselves to trout fingerlings in fish farms too. So not quite as successful as the Rakali, but still another example. It shouldn't come as too big a surprise too. While it's obviously not a rodent, Animals like the large Eurasian water shrew show smaller, non-carnivoran competitors, can still have a go at things in similar niches without just getting outcompeted. There are some specialists too. Dolman's tree mouse is a mimecophage, which is to say an ant and termite eater. It lives in the roots of trees and climbs them at night to feed on the species of ant that build their nests beneath the leaves. So perhaps not exactly a big game hunter, it is still a rodent that gets its food from predating other living things, although perhaps being more like a tiny anteater or pangolin than anything else. Then there are the worm-eating rodents. There are two convergently evolved families of vermivores that snuffle and forage through wet leaf litter for their daily bread, occasionally burrowing into the damp soil too, but chiefly using smell to sniff out their food. Like their prey, they tend to come out more at night, and often patrol certain runways to increase their odds of a successful encounter. And lastly, we have something more of a generalist, the grasshopper mice. Of the genus Onychromes, they're small predatory rodents that you'll likely know from that screaming mouse video, if anything. They're chiefly insectivores that seem happy to take a wide array of insects, especially scorpions and grasshoppers, but will also occasionally kill and eat other vertebrates as well. Notably, they have a powerful resistance to the venom of sympatric bark scorpions, whom they will also readily kill and consume, and a partially cornified stomach with the glands hidden in protective folds 
to prevent shards of chitin damaging their innards. There are still limitations to their predatory nature, and other species like deer mice are too fast and agile to be caught, and they're also unable to take down larger kangaroo rats too. But overall, they're still proficient predators of the southern deserts. Interestingly too, outside of specialists, other rodents may well dabble in carnivory as well. A study done on three types of rodent, striped field mice, narrow-skulled voles, and Campbell's dwarf hamsters, found that predation was actually an evolutionary stable strategy for the rodents, which is to say a fairly good and successful one, with all rodents showing similar success to insectivores like shrews, and hamsters in particular arguably showing aptitude for predation. Studies on lab mice too have found that it's relatively simple to tweak neurons in the amygdala to turn mice into more predatory animals, with one set being to engage predatory pursuit, and another to actually deliver killing bites. So no matter which way you choose, it seems rodents can only be a stone's throw away from becoming a lot more predatory. But what about other niches? like being the dominant herbivores. And in this regard, we literally have capybara. Not many unusual zingers to cover here. They're pretty well known and are a bit of a mic drop on the topic, really. It always surprises me when rodents becoming an ecologically dominant megafauna are played as this zany left-field speculation, when capybara really are just right there. They're typically the most common large herbivore in southern American wetland ecosystems. They're reasonably gregarious grazers and often form the major prey base of large predators like jaguar. So for all intents and purposes, they really are effectively the deer or antelope of neotropical wetlands, like the Pantanal and Ibera. Perhaps to a lesser extent, there are also maras too. Whilst there's not similar information readily available on their abundance in a landscape, they do provide another example of a large rodent with at least some success, and one that's physically reminiscent of something like a deer or antelope. In prehistory, there are even better examples that also line up further with what some would want to tick the speculative boxes. Joseph Artagasia was the largest rodent ever, with estimates ranging from a more modest 500 kilograms to the more bison-sized 1,000 kilograms depending on the study or method. Reconstructions typically paint it as a giant guinea pig, with suggestions of using its tusk-like incisors for a number of versatile purposes. Phoebaromis was another giant rodent, with estimates of 150 kilograms, or in some cases considerably higher, also depending on the study or method. And there is also the more famous giant beaver too, estimated at around 100 kilograms or so. So there are both numerous incidents of rodents reaching both speculative sizes and speculative levels of ecosystem relevance on the herbivore side at least. The Cavimorph lineage of rodents also apparently has a trend for gigantism too, with related capybara specimens also getting to around 100 kilograms. The giant rodents dipped out at various stages of the Pleistocene, so aren't so far from the times of today, and were typically believed to have been ended by varying aspects of climate change. So on both fronts, what's keeping rodents back from fulfilling their speculative dreams? And the short answer is, everyone else. The Rakali only got its lucky break due to there being no native mustaloids in Australia, and the crab and fish-eating rats are far from ubiquitous in South American waterways, as where there are rodents, there are typically mustaloids to follow them. Mustelids are both specialised predators of rodents to an extent, but also occupy the same niche rodents trying to become predators would want to occupy, that of microvertebrate carnivore. So there's no real room for adaptive radiation here. Indeed, the lengthy body forms of mustelids are believed to be an ancient adaptation to hunt early rodents in their dens, with the more bulky form like badgers also being somewhat rodent specialised, albeit dig them out of their burrows rather than pursue them into it. In short, so long as mustelids are a thing, both the role they take and the predation pressure they put on rodents mean it's unlikely for them to get anywhere fast in this regard. The mega rodents in South America are believed to have come about due to it being cut off from everywhere else. Interestingly, marsupials at least partially took the role of top predators in South American earlier eras too, which likely prevented them becoming top predators as well as herbivorous megafauna. So carnivorans aren't the only one to have beat them to the finishing line in this regard. The related family of lagomorphs too, 
also show the prevalence of ungulates can block smaller herbivore families from really getting large in size. Even if lagomorphs, like rodents, are still hugely successful on a population scale in modern day. But this does also raise another problem with the trope, in that, are rodents ever going to get this opportunity? And probably not, as this is something of a larger problem in Spec Evo. The assumption that larger mammals, or perhaps rather their extended families, are weak, delicate, and useless. Much Spec Evo assumes that mammalian megafauna goes extinct at some point with the hand-waving explanations typically being something along the lines of either natural climate change, humans ruining everything and making them extinct, or the two points combined with anthropogenic climate change and general biodiversity collapse. And these are fair enough, I guess, but the problem comes with the assumption that all small mammals are either rodents and lagomorphs, and that there is not, in fact, a fleet of resilient small mammals from other taxa much more likely to take over. To come back to mustelids again, and well that's it, mustelids. As mentioned, they're successful small generalists that are good at hunting the rodents, that will seemingly also be surviving these hypothetical apocalypses. So it's very difficult to imagine a scenario where all mustelids go extinct, but their rodent prey base hasn't, to say nothing of other similar small carnivorans, that are even more generalist like civets and mongoose and to say even less of other carnivoran species like wildcats and foxes, that can also sustain themselves entirely on rodents as small prey specialists too. Getting rid of lions and wolves is fairly easy. Getting rid of wildcats, weasels and foxes isn't. Unless you're South Korea. From the herbivore side of things, small ungulates are also much tougher than many give credit for as well. The Maryland dick dicks can go their entire adult lives without drinking, and have specialised organs to help water retention, and withstanding higher temperatures, even surpassing those of camels. And they're not even the most specialised of a family specialised for high aridity, with all of them having specialised breathing apparatus to do so. Even if the areas they currently inhabit get too hot, climate change often induces range shifts in animals too and they can likely move into cooler areas as the change happens. Unless you're planning on making most of the globe uninhabitably hot, in which case rodents aren't doing too well either. In thicker environments, there are also ungulates like mouse deer. Whilst not as overtly resilient as something like dick dicks, they do provide another example of microungulates that can be used as checks to cache post-mechafaunal zucking. Many major megafaunal ungulate assemblages started as small, forest-dwelling animals like diker and mouse deer, until climate change brought on large grassland environments that led to them being larger, social, herd-dwelling animals. Considering the range of distribution and habitats these microungulates can live in, from arid desert to dense rainforest, again, it's hard to see them going extinct without rodents following suit and they're a far more likely candidate to repopulate megafaunal niches after a vague great extinction. I also think it's just worth noting how resilient a lot of large mammal species are too, and just how hard it would be to actually have a megafaunal zucking. With large charismatic species like leopards and puma, they often have huge ranges with deserts, snowpack, and dense rainforest all included, and others like wolves, black bears, and foxes also tolerate huge variation in temperature, from deserts to snowfall, a range they can shift over due to that adaptability. And similarly, some will show huge differences in size across that range to accommodate for environmental factors, or show morphological plasticity in mass for the same reason but on a chronological scale, with species like wolves and lions growing and shrinking over much of the Pleistocene, in accordance with the changing environmental factors. Impala have been around for about 5 million years, essentially unchanged due to their success, and are found across huge portions of Africa as the dominant herbivore biomass in much of their range. In short, mammals didn't get where they are today by just stumbling into it. They're exceptional at what they do, and are amazingly adaptable in terms of both habitat and climate. Whilst, sadly, human persecution is a much fairer bet at taking out a lot of megafauna, the notion they're just going to crumble on a hot or cold day is pretty disingenuous. Especially as this is seemingly all Dixon had in mind when he zucked most carnivorans from Afterman. The point about genus lifespan also feels like a pointless distinction, when the carnivora themselves evolved not so long after rodents in the Eocene. 
and as an order have stuck around ever since. But not to end on such a killjoy note, it could be worth noting that it may not be game over for all aspects of this trope. Whilst the old world probably has too many divisions of fun-sized ungulates, fungulates if you will, waiting in the wings, and you're generally going to struggle to boot out the smaller carnivora, the new world may well become something of a rodent paradise. South America is essentially already taken care of, but to also look at ungulate families in North America, they don't really do microungulates. Their smallest is the white-tailed deer, and then the rest is essentially cervids of greater sizes and bison, and feral horses too, one could argue. If a megafaunal zuck did happen, then North America is essentially left without large herbivorous ungulates, and no real way to restock them until another ice age occurs, but there will be plenty of rodents left over. And some quite big ones too, with animals like beavers, porcupines and marmots, as well as some lagomorphs too. In short, it would have everything it needs to create some of Dixon's fanciful rodent herbivores at least. How a land ruled by giant rodents would then affect the landscape, and the still probably carnivoran predators that hunt them, is for you and others to decide. So, overall, trying to replace everything with rodents is something of an insult to the tenacity and adaptability of other mammalian families, and to try and truly recreate Dixon's Afterman, you may be better off with a seed world. But there will likely be plenty niches, even if not carnivorous, in assorted hypothetical futures. It's also worth pointing out one factor used to claim the superiority of rodents is their ability to live in places like cities. And this is due to them getting hard carried by man. The anthropogenic warmth and food are key factors facilitating their survival. Get rid of these, as getting rid of humans is often an obligate factor in Spec Evo. And urban rats and mice are very much up the creek without a paddle now. Thanks for watching. And thanks too to my patrons Phenomenon, The Super Estuper, Sam Burgo, Sona Blobsong, Kay Sandum, Big Al, Erengar Steiny, Flygon's Archives, Hui Hui, Original Username, Tristan Berry, Evely, Howleth, Archazor Queen, Seth Fakeless Name, Zaser, Dodecablos, and Bazugazu Bachuatsu Bachumatsu for their ongoing kindness keeping things going too. A link is provided in the description for any who'd like to sign up, and any amount is always appreciated. As ever too, likes and shares always help out, subscribe if you haven't already, and let me know your thoughts in the comments too. Similarly, do comment with ideas for future Spikivo shorts as well, or maybe not. The Breath Attacks one was from a comment suggestion, and you all hated that one it seems. But if nothing else, the past few videos have been a bit more in line with the length I initially intended for these, as implied by their title, even if the next one will probably be the longest. But a while to wait for it. As I said a few videos ago, I'll be taking January off, but content will resume on the 1st of February, and at least I'm not sodding off to Nebula. Also, as said, there will be a mini-series opening things again of six videos unlike anything else I've done, and unrelated to Monster Hunter or even any type of large reptile or similar creature. Hopefully you may still enjoy them, or perhaps they'll permanently destroy the channel forever. Who knows? Either way, the devout loyalists who watch my videos regardless of topic, and those who use me as a sleep aid, will be needed more than ever. But after that, more typical content will resume, with more Monster Hunter content that you're used to. Shame we'll have to wait until this time next year, until I probably say anything on Wilds, but oh well. And as well as more Monster Hunter, there'll be more on Primeval, more Movie Monsters, more Spec Evo shorts, and plenty of fringe commentary pieces too. Let's hope it'll be a good one. And until then, I hope everyone here has a happy new year.